coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a new organization called the Open Money Initiative that um, I helped co-found uh, with uh, my co-founders Jill Carlson and Jamal Montessor. Um, I'm the only one who could make it here this time, but uh, they also send their regards and uh, wish they could be here. Um, so I want to start by taking a step back from the technicals uh, details, and uh, you know we all love uh, these things that are fundamental to what we're building. Um, but what why we exist is um, we we need to focus on the human aspects of why this technology is so important. So that's why we created the Open Money Initiative. And uh, I want to ask a question: Why do we need open money? When I introduce you to Lorena, who's a 48-year-old woman uh, from Venezuela, who, in order to get her money out of the country, she needed to cash it in for US dollars, which is, she needed to use the black market for that. And then she put money in her hair to outsmart the guards that were looking for you know, any way that they could uh, seize money uh, from people who were crossing the border, because these people are you know, very, uh, in a very precarious condition. And the guards also are uh, suffering the economic mismanagement of uh, my country, Venezuela. So she outsmarted the guards in this way. And what we're looking for, in, uh, or like what, what we did as our first project, is to look for behavior, better money products. So what we do as an organization is we research how people use money in closed economies and collapsing monetary systems. So you might have heard of the term human-centered design. Um, we listen and observe. We practice design thinking in a process of iterative. So if you are familiar with uh, how IDEO frog design works, it's very similar. Uh, our process is not really research. It's, it's, it's more like a search, right? So it's not academic style very quantitative, you know, we, we could also get into that, but uh, for our first project, what we, want, what, what we wanted to do is to get into the details of people's lives and how they survive and how they, in some cases, thrive using open money or trying to uh, get access to open financial systems. So very quickly, we did uh, 11 ethnographic interviews in site in Colombia. We did six interviews uh, speaking with Venezuela on the phone. Uh, unfortunately, we could not go into Venezuela for logistical reasons, but um, we were able to get a pretty good sense of how people live there. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I'm from there too, but it's the, the situation evolves so quickly that it's very important to go there and to stay in touch with reality. Um, and then we did a diary study as well. We did uh, 16 diary studies with people that reported what they were doing, and they got uh, compensated for their participation, of course and uh, just like their money behaviors and, and their day-to-day -day lives. And then we did displacements, which are um, kind of a probes uh, where we have, um, we have people use Bitcoin, for example, for, for a transaction, something that is kind of slightly uncomfortable. That's why we call them displacements. We're looking to, to see not you know, how Bitcoin changes a life, but what are the, step, the, the steps that we would need to take in order to, to make Bitcoin or to make you know, any kind of open money systems more accessible to people? So the process looks a lot like this. Uh, after we do the interviews and after we uh, collect our data, we have these like, huge heaps of post-it notes and uh, we try to organize them and distill them into, into insights so that you can get the most of the research without actually going through this like, very, very long uh, process. So we organize them into three buckets. So we, we call them confident, resilient, and open. And these are features that we think uh, systems should have in order to be good open money systems. Uh, let's start with confident. Um, and these are all things that we uncovered from, from, from our research, right? So number one is the networks of people have replaced the roles of companies and institutions in Venezuela. So you can't rely on the state. Uh, for anything, and, and you can't rely on banks to, for example, exchange money. So what you do is you go to your social networks, or you go to, to, to digital social networks, or you go to your neighbor, you go to the people that you know, and then you try to find ways to send money home. For example, if you're in Colombia and you want to send money home, the way most people do it is they go through a Facebook group, and they see something like this, and these are the banks that uh, this like service supports, and uh, that's the way that people kind of 
try to do it because to, to get money into Venezuela, and I'll get into this, it's not so easy as just like, oh, do a wire transfer or do a Western Union. Western Union doesn't really operate. And so we're seeing behaviors like this where you have, use WhatsApp. This is a, a money changer that we met and that we worked with. And uh, he, every day he makes these like um, images of the rate of the day, and then he sends it away, like he sends it off to, to his uh, contacts. And then people that are interested, uh, they say, oh, I want, I want to change some money. And then that's how he gets more, more customers. And in order to have a broader reach, he uses uh, this like WhatsApp status feature, which is virtually unknown in most of the countries that are where, where I've lived, but it's very, very used in Venezuela and Colombia and probably the rest of Latin America. Uh, it's kind of like Instagram stories. So, but instead of like posting or maybe interspersed with your stories of like what you're doing, you also post opportunities to buy and sell uh, dollars, uh, currency, etc. So, if you want to move money out of Croatia, for example, to the U.S., it's pretty simple. You just do a wire transfer. If you want to move money out of Venezuela, you have to do two moves within two systems. So you need to find someone, a counterparty in Venezuela that has a U.S. bank account, and, and you also need to have a U.S. bank account, for example, if you want to like, use the U.S., or this applies also to Europe and applies to every country. So um, it, this is what is called a Hawala. You might be uh, already familiar with it, but it's just to, to illustrate that it, this is what is going on, and, and this is like the networks of people are very, very important for this process uh, because there's no center, central institution that you can trust to go and, and, and do your transfer. In Venezuela, every transaction is forced to feel like a drug deal. So, this is me trying to send money to a charity in Venezuela. We were in Colombia uh, at the border, and this guy, uh, this is what he does for a living. Uh, is, uh, he, they're like a regulated uh, money uh, exchange house. They're not really allowed uh, by Colombian law to uh, send money electronically, uh, but they do anyways. And what they do is um, they connect with an associate in Venezuela who does the other part of the transaction because um, you, would, like, you, you give them money in pesos and then the counterparty uh, moves money inside Venezuela. Because now, uh, because of our government regulation in Venezuela, you can't even access banking, Venezuelan banking from outside the country, you need to like, you would need to fake that you have, are using an IP address from Venezuela, and obviously most people don't know how to do that. So this is the workaround that they have. So as you can see, it, so like, it's, it's a cumbersome process, you like, you have to like, wait for the guy to like, send you a WhatsApp message, and then it, you wait for a couple hours for the counterparty to act, and then they send you a screenshot of the, of the thing. It is very, you know, cumbersome, right? Um, number three is, Despite scarcity and economic collapse, some people are thriving. So we spoke with a man that said this, hyperinflation has made some millionaires. I got a million, loan, um, I got a million dollar loan in Bolivars, exchanged it in the black market, and bought an apartment in New York City. The following year, I paid off the loan with $20,000. So this is a system, of course, that is entrenching inequality, uh, which is really bad, but it really surprises to see that people are still making money from the crisis and they're, the, the luxury restaurants in Caracas are still full. So for example, if you were to design a system that only targets you know, the very, very poor or, like, you know, the, or maybe the people who have some kind of threshold, you like, okay, you target smartphones. I think it's, it, it's worth considering to include these people in the system as well because if they have a lot of money and they don't know how, what to do with it, uh, you might be able to enable uh, money flows from people who have uh, money to the people that, that, that don't. Uh, and then we've seen also that there's people taking advantage of others uh, by the way of pyramid schemes and you know easy get-rich-quick get schemes. Uh, here you can see that 37% in, in 12 days and lots of emojis. And uh, it's often the most vulnerable uh, who fall prey to this. This is a woman that we spoke with. She uh, lives in Cucuta. She's in her 60s. And uh, she was asking us if it were, you know, our opinion, is this, is this a good idea? Like, I, I got this from a, a, fr a friend, like my, my son's friend, but it, it seems kind of sketchy. So people have this intuition that it's not, you know, it can't be that easy to make money. But, you know, sometimes they override these intu intuitions because they, they are forced to survive. And under those conditions, it's difficult to kind of, like, put, their, put yourself in, in, their, in their shoes. And also, um, 
this is the this is what they can trust. Like if if your network is the thing, only thing that is protecting you, uh, it's also it can be uh, a force for scams and a force for uh, you know bad bad behavior. Uh, resilient. So Venezuelans endure constant swings between modern and primitive existences. You one day you might not have access to water or internet or electricity or all of the above, and the, the following day you might have everything. So this unpredictability is baked into the system, and uh, it means that you can no longer have like a stable job and like reliably go to the office because you might have to take care of your kids because you know that public transport is not working and you can't get them to school. There are all kinds of interactions that happen here that are very difficult to design for, uh, and that means that we should design systems that are resilient in the face of uh, shortages and occasional shortages. Uh, but also shortages that cause other problems to, to surface as well. Inform, income from the informal economy often eclipses paid salaries. So we've spoken, for example, with uh, this university professor. She says, I work at a site called Digital Tasks. I spend most of my evenings doing simple tasks for students in Panama. I make more there than I do at my job as a university professor. So we've seen people who would be thriving in other, in other conditions, uh, who would have good careers, that are being forced to do things that are suboptimal, or they, they, they are sacrificing their long-term prospects for short-term uh, subsistence. Leaving Venezuela is like going from a sinking ship to a lifeboat with a few provisions. We saw this a lot when uh, we were speaking with the people in Colombia, that everyone, almost everyone, had the expectation, oh, when, it, when I leave Venezuela, I'll finally be able to do this and that, you know? But it's, uh, it's complicated because many people don't have legal paperwork to, to reside in the countries that they're moving to. Many people don't have a safety net. They don't, they don't, they're not moving with their entire families. Often, oftentimes, it's uh, a single family member, maybe the younger and uh, the most capable uh, physically or, or intellectually sometimes, that is you know, going and, and taking one for, for the team and uh, trying to uh, like make, make it work and send money home. Uh, so it, it can feel frustrating, and, and there's a lot in people's minds when they do this like, big jump. Open. Nobody wants the Bolivar, the national currency, but it is necessary to survive. And it's something that really surprised me, too. I would expect that everyone would be using the dollar and Bitcoin and all these things. But no, because it turns out that the Bolivar is the most widely distributed currency. It's the only thing that kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's what functions as money, even though it's really bad money, it's what people have, and breaking habits and breaking, you know, the like implicit trust that people have in the, in the currency is hard. And we actually spoke with many people that, that, that were sad about the state of the Bolivar and, and were proud, like they were initially proud of, of the Bolivar saying, look, oh yeah, this is like my, my national currency, you know, like I have a, a, hundred, a hundred Bolivar bill here, let me show you, so that people would look at this money and this is worthless, by the way. This is like, it doesn't, uh, it's like 0.0001 or something. Maybe I'm missing a few zeros there. And this was, issues la la this was issued last year. This bill was issued last year. And so people would look at this money and say, yeah, you know, like, it's, it's a shame. Like, I, I'm proud of my country. Like, this is, this is so sad that my country is, is being put uh, through this. So uh, people, in some ways, want to use the Bolivar, but they, you know, they, they don't want to actually hold it. They want to hold U.S. dollars and they want to hold, uh, you know, Colombian pesos when you're close to the border. Um, and here, you can see, you know, we went to Cucuta, which is the border town between Colombia and Venezuela, and uh, this is what bills are for now. They are art. They are to make art. And all of the things that you're seeing here, all of the bills that you see here are probably worth one dollar in total, like if you, if you add everything up. And there's some like, really nice art coming out of it, but it's you know, just to show that uh, this is like, absolutely ridiculous. Um, product sellers have the power to choose the means of payment. So we, we spoke with a guy, and it said, I looked everywhere for my mom's medicine. None of the stores had it, so I looked on Instagram. I found it, but the seller only accepted Zelle. If you're familiar with Zelle, it's an interbank transfer system in the US between US banks. Uh, I don't have an account, so my uncle had to help me out. So it, it turns out that people are using foreign systems to be able to transact because there's not enough dollars in cash to go around. And there are some people with access with, to US banking. So 
this is creating some discrimination between the people that have access to US banking and the people who don't have access to US banking. And if you don't have access to US banking, you have access to fewer products, which is a real problem. When you live in Venezuela, there's no good way to save. Um, we got a, a few examples of this. When I'm going to the movies or my mom is go going grocery shopping, I change Bitcoin into Bolivars at that very moment. It's easier and faster to exchange Bitcoin than dollars in cash. This is a woman who just is graduating now from college, uh, from the university where I, where I graduated as well. And she's smart, she's very energetic, capable, and she got into Bitcoin because she was, she was mining uh, at first, you know, she was interested in the, in the, in the technology, uh, actually interested in the technology. And, uh, and she started mining because like electricity is so cheap there, you've, you've probably seen like reports of this, and you know, she has, her, her family lives in, a, in a, an apartment in Caracas, middle class, and then she started, you know, collecting the Bitcoin, and, and she now uses it as, as her savings. And it's not an ideal way to save, of course, because Bitcoin goes up and down, but it is a lot better than the Bolivar. So the way that she does use the money is, instead of keeping her savings in Bolivars, she keeps her savings in, on local Bitcoins, like part of her savings local Bitcoins, and then whenever she needs the money, she just goes to local Bitcoins and cashes the money out. It takes like 15 minutes, which is pretty remarkable. I pay my maid in dollars, but she doesn't want to take the bills home with her because it's unsafe. So I hold the bills for her. I'm like her bank. This is the wealthy investor that we, that we talk to uh, as well. I use a nonprofit, sends me my monthly scholarship to my Uphold account. It's in dollars. I can then use RTM to exchange them into Bolivars. RTM is a Mexican startup that is doing work in Venezuela. And uh, at the moment, it's not really widely accessible because you need a VPN to access and uh, they don't have a mobile version, but I hope this changes very soon. So they're coming up with a new platform very soon. I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Um, and I wanna talk about opportunity areas, right? Because uh, we, we weren't content enough with just uh, providing you with you know, the, the summary of the research, but we also were designers. And we wanna highlight the opportunity areas and some product concepts that may inspire you to create products. And uh, I'm really happy if you could to talk after if you're interested in any of this. I would like to make all of these happen. Um, so how might we enable access? And I'm gonna refer back to the three uh, concepts or three buckets that we have. Let's start with confidence. We often say in this community that we should avoid having trust, that we should have, avoid having systems that rely on trust. But I would challenge that and I would say you should leverage trust. Trust already exists in communities and if you can leverage it, you can build much more powerful systems and much more usable systems. So first uh, concept, you know, these are very high level, is a digital banking ambassador. So what if you had an application that onboarded you into uh, how, how to be um, an ambassador for, for, the, for the community, for your uh, particular community? You could, for example, pick the most tech savvy person in a group and that person could be an advocate for Bitcoin or be an advocate for Zcash or be an advocate for you know, open money systems and you know that person could teach other people to do it and, and we could have this model where we have incentives so that communities start using this maybe at, le at least at first for saving but in in the mean in the in the, in the long run maybe uh, they will they will be able to use them as currency right uh, growing circles marketplace so We've seen that access to product is very important and it's, it's not equal, so what if um, you could rely on your social network uh, of choice and in a privacy pres preserving way, I, I would prefer if we were that way, you could see that you could have some friends in common with the people that you're buying and then th therefore you can extend your circle of, circle of trust so you know that when you get a product you're not gonna get cheated or you know, that, that, that is, uh, there is a little bit more, more trust in the system. So resilient. Uh, we need to ensure consistent access even under bad infrastructure. So what if we could have offline mobile transfers? You know, uh, we don't really need to guarantee uh, perfect uh, resistance or, or, or perfect, um, re yeah, resistance uh, to double, double spends, right? Like if, if, you have, uh, if you have a relationship with a shop owner, for example, and you go every week and sometimes you say, well, I, I don't have money, can, you, can, you, like, can I pay you back like next week? Oftentimes people are saying yes, because like point of sale systems are failing, there's not enough cash, there's a short of, shortage of cash in Venezuela, so people are relying on this and this trust, so you don't need a perfectly trustless system 
to to operate and if if you could enable something that already works a little bit better than what they have and if if it were like really difficult to you know for an average person to fudge this uh system of like you know like maybe you use bluetooth maybe you use something else uh to like send money from one phone to another and then when it connects it puts the blockchain and so on uh then that would be an interesting concept to to explore and then you could also have bills, you know, like there's, uh, there's some people working on, like, you know, Open Dime and so on. Uh, this is something that's interesting. Uh, not all phones have NFC in Venezuela, unfortunately. There's about 5 million smartphones that are Android 4 and 5, so um, they're, they're old models. But if you could have, for example, bills that, you know, that, that, that are, uh, you could check their, their validity uh, by scanning them uh, with an NFC chip, uh, this would be something interesting too to explore as well. And then open, uh, we need to make systems that are accessible to everyone in practice and not just in theory. Uh, for example, let's, uh, let's say that there is an easy cash out USD wallet and let's call this, this is a stable coin called USDX uh, whatever and you can deposit money there and you can get money out and the way maybe it works is by, you know, local Bitcoin is already pretty liquid. You can, you can get Bolivars, which is the currency that again people use. Uh, you know, pretty easily using Bitcoin. So you have local Bitcoin's liquidity between Bitcoin and Bolivar, and you could have global liquidity between Bitcoin and Dai, or Bitcoin and your favorite stablecoin. And um, since people, what they what they want uh, first and foremost is access to the U.S. dollar, you could enable this this access by leveraging the the liquidity pools. But you have to package it in a way that you know is easy for the average person to use. Um, you could also multiply the money changers. You know, everyone in Venezuela could be a money changer because they have access to at least two jurisdictions. They have access to their banking at home and they have access to Bitcoin, which is a global jurisdiction. So let's maybe make more people aware of how they can be effective money changers and more peers in the network mean more access. And then you could also have a universal point of sale system. So thinking back about this guy who couldn't... Uh, use Zelle until he asks his uncle and so on. Maybe, you know, there's, there's a way that you could peer in, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and I'm sure Zelle will not like this, but in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, you could uh, find someone that is your peer, like that, that is your uh, counterparty, and you could deposit Bolivar somewhere, and seamlessly that, you know, there's a chain of, of transactions, and then eventually some Zelle dollars get into your merchant's account. So it's like a reverse point of sale system. That would be also interesting to explore. And then join crypto, crypto accounts, because, you know, there, since there is always, you know, the more tech savvy person, maybe, you know, the person who is in Colombia, just uh, making it work, uh, sending money home, maybe they can share an account with uh, their family members in Venezuela and they don't even have to do a transaction. You could, you could save on, on transaction fees because you can join, you, you, you have trust, you're not gonna spend the money of your, of your mother. So uh, perhaps this is a way to, to get started with you know, how, how, how people like, get, get more access to, to cryptocurrency. And I'm gonna talk briefly about some very like, small engineering big victories that we are uh, proud of. Uh, Coinbase Wallet just released a light version uh, and you know, kudos to them because uh, we've been kind of pushing for this uh, for a long time. And uh, you know, because Give Crypto has the the mission of uh, getting crypto into people's hands, and it turns out that you need wallets that are work on the devices that people have in order to get like it's the most basic requirement. So up until last month, the Coinbase wallet did not work on most Venezuelan phones, and now it does, which is you know still needs needs work, but it's it's an amazing. Uh, thing, and it only took you know it doesn't it doesn't take that that much effort, it, and it you know there are trade-offs engineering that we can talk about, but it, this is generally positive. And then this is a wallet that I've been working on separately that is called Daily, uh, where you can send money over WhatsApp, sending payment links, and uh, it already works. It's uh, it's in Alpha, let's say, and uh, it's on the Play Store. If you want access, let me know, and I'll I'll put you on the list. And I think this is something that would allow people to, to understand, you know, without using addresses, they could send money around. This works with uh, DAI or XDAI, uh, the Proof of Authority Network. So I think developing this and, uh, and others, and you know, of course, this is still a closed system. You, need, you still need liquidity and you still need to access, uh, you know, to, to bridge the gaps. But I think this is something that, that is worth uh, keeping, keeping going. So I um, want to close with why do we need open digital cash? Uh, you know, because I don't want to just talk about 
open money, we are a private a privacy conference, and I think we need to take the systems further and make them private. Uh, even though the Venezuelan government doesn't have the resources to monitor transactions in blockchain today, this can change very quickly, especially if they maybe have China's help, which is I could I could not discount. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen this. We, this is why we need digital cash, because paper is going to die, paper money is going to die, and before it dies, we better have an alternative that works, because if not, that is the road that goes to totalitarianism. So thank you, and especially thank you to the Zcash Foundation for uh, generously funding this project, and I'm looking forward to keep working with all of you to bring more open money to the people. And follow us on Twitter, please. Thank you.